Hi, I'm the state entomologist and the state apiarist for the Ohio Department of Agriculture. And I was asked to um, recount uh, kind of what we saw this year um, uh, in the inspection world. So here we go. Um, this has been a, a very different year for all of us. Um, maybe a year to forget. <laughs> um, but I, I know it has been uh, hard for all of us and um, certainly been hard for us beekeepers as well. Uh, to start out, I wanted to go back to the beginning of the apiary program. So the apiary laws and rules were actually were written back in 1904. Uh, they hired the first state apiarist in 1934 uh, to help control the American fabric, uh, which was going uh, crazy in Ohio. Uh, it was uh, really spreading fast. Uh, records show about two thirds of all the colonies in Ohio were either dead or dying from American fabric. So they initiated the state apiarist and the county inspection program to go out and find these infected colonies and burn them and try to contain this disease. And it worked. Um, in 1930, uh, we had about 14% of all the colonies had uh, American fabric. Within 10 years in 1940, 3% uh, had American fabric. And within 10 years after that, we were down to 2%. Uh, right now in Ohio, we are at 0.1 one hundredth of a percent of the colonies inspected have American fabric, but it's still here and we still need to watch for it. Um, we also have other pests and diseases that we're trying to keep an eye on. Um, if for your own protection, um, I encourage you to read. Uh, here's the links to our laws and rules um, so that you can uh, uh, be better informed and be, know how you are protected. Mainly, the APRI program is here to have healthy bee, uh, beehives to encourage uh, healthy beekeeping um, and have good pollination in Ohio. That's really the key. Uh, we want to promote the Ohio beekeeping industry um, and um, help it uh, be its, at its very best. So topics today. <laughs> um, I want to talk briefly about the apiary program and our some updates and our laws and rules. Lots of colony issues that we've had this year. Um, so updates on our on the pests that we're seeing, a little bit of fall catch up of what we're seeing this fall. Um, advice for new beekeepers, and then some other uh, tidbits. So we're off. Um, this graph was made by um, Ed Newman, one of our county bee inspectors, and he's going back to 1960. Shows the trend and how our beekeeping numbers have changed. Uh, we had about 120,000 colonies uh, back in 1960. The number of apiaries, this is blue line here, has remained more or less the same. The number of colonies per yard has dropped uh, dramatically. Um, we had uh, the uh, honey import uh, importation uh, affected it. 1980, there's a big here because in the mid 80s we had the Pickia mite and the varroa mite. Uh, it dropped again in the late 90s when we had uh, a colony collapse disorder uh, showing up. Now it is starting to pick up a little bit. In general, uh, most of our colonies are in the cities. Uh, they have one to five hives. So inspectors are spending more time driving from yard to yard instead of having you know 20 to 30 colonies per yard. So kind of a shift in, in how we inspect and how we keep these. And speaking of the county inspectors, um, as you are aware, <clears throat> it's been very hard to find alcohol this year uh, to clean our tools. We've had a very difficult time finding uh, um, disposable gloves and other cleaning aids, which we need to do our inspected inspections. Uh, we're also trying to stay six feet away from a beekeeper so that we are not you know, either contracting or giving any uh, viruses uh, to our beekeepers. So we're trying our, our best to be uh, be careful with this. Um, as you know, uh, county inspectors are appointed and paid by the county. Each county is different. Um, some have a very tight budget um, and these county inspectors can't afford 
to go across the county uh, multiple times. They go to the furthest county, uh, furthest township, and kind of work their way back. Uh, so scheduling can be difficult because if a beekeeper can't meet on the day that they're planning to be there, they may, they may not get inspected because they may not be able to afford to come back. Uh, so the very limited time and budget uh, in, in general. Uh, our inspection schedules change um, minute by minute. You get to a yard that they've registered five hives and they have 20, 20 hives. We spend a lot of time when we're there uh, teaching the beekeepers, um, helping them, uh, diagnosing problems, especially in the spring. We do uh, autopsies on the bee colonies, so dead bee colonies. So I ask that you please be patient um, because we have very good inspectors and they're, they're doing their very best. Uh, we have some long, hot days. Uh, imagine getting to a yard and these hives were over my head. So I'm glad I had a, a tall guy there to, to help me uh, take those supers off. Um, our inspectors, our job is to look for pests and diseases and to stop the spread. Uh, however, they do a lot more. Um, they're teaching, they're um, helping beekeepers fix a problem. They're doing um, demonstrations. Um, so we, we have a lot of very hardworking uh, inspectors out there uh, doing their very best to help you have uh, healthy colonies. Um, so um, I wanna talk briefly about our definition of a nuke. This has been in the books a couple years. A nuke or a nucleus colony is basically, a, it's a miniature hive. It should have the queen and her progeny, her queen, her eggs, her larva, her pupa, and that colony should be ready to burst. When you buy that nuke, you take the lid off and look at what you're gonna get. Look at the number of frames of bees and brood because that colony should be able to take off by itself. You shouldn't have foundation frames with parallel comb. You shouldn't have like two frames of bees and three frames of foundation. You want that colony to be able to maintain and take care of itself. And that queen should not be in a cage. She should be loose because you want to make sure that's her progeny in there. Uh, this was sent to me this spring. This was in a nuke that they purchased. This is wrong. Uh, you, this should never even be in a colony, let alone in, in a nuke that you, that you purchase. So please, when you see things that don't look right, please let me know because we're trying to educate. Uh, we're trying to help you have the healthiest bees that are possible. And that leads us right to uh, que our queen certification program. Um, we're getting, trying to make it better. Um, this year with COVID, it's been especially difficult because we couldn't get out in the yards in a lot of cases. But by law, and this has been in the book since the beginning, anybody who is selling queen, selling nukes, selling bees, they have to be certified. If they're selling equipment, they have to be inspected. Um, and this is just to protect you as a beekeeper that you're getting healthy bees. If you're going to buy like a, a champion bull or a horse, a racing horse, you want to make sure they have good breeding and that they're healthy. Uh, this is the same thing with honeybees. Um, you want to make sure that you're buying healthy bees that aren't going to collapse. You want to make sure that those bees have been inspected. They don't have high mites or no SEMA or whatever. And as you can see here, our requests have really uh, gone up. We had 760 requests for our queen certification this year. So it's, you know, it's, it's a challenge for inspectors to try to get out there and do all these inspections. But uh, this year, um, we are going to inspect sometime during the season, and that's good for the entire year. So they have to be inspected each year, but it's not necessarily by spring. So they're their certification isn't going to end in May. It's going to be good for the entire season, but they still have to be inspected. So ask for that certificate, ask for that inspection, because we had beekeepers who are selling nukes and queens who have never been inspected, or they may have been inspected in another county, but not your county. So please be careful. And, <laughs> uh, colony issues galore. Uh, we had, starting out in the spring, we had weather extremes. We had cold, wet, rainy spring that seemed like it was going to take forever uh, to end. Uh, late freezes uh, killed the locust and the basswood, so they didn't have a good 
um, spring flow, nectar flow. We had um, record number of days of heat um, this summer, over 90 degrees. In uh, Franklin County, we had 17 days that was over 90 degrees. So hard to be in the bees, hard to inspect bees. Uh, bees loved it. <laughs> uh, but it was really hard to, you know, treat your bees for mites or do much of anything. And then this fall, certain parts of Ohio, especially in the northwest corner, north southwest corner, uh, very dry uh, to the point that the fall goldenrod had no nectar. So if they took their honey off, expecting the bees to refill with nectar, they didn't get it because the, the flowers had no nectar in them. Uh, lots of COVID issues. Uh, shipping bees across state lines this spring has, was difficult. Trying to buy equipment. All the companies, um, supply companies were, were backstocked. So you couldn't even find equipment. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, queen problems as well. Uh, queens disappeared. Uh, poorly made queens, so they were being superseded. And then we had a case of wingless queens that I want to talk about. And then uh, colonies, swarms galore. We all had, you know, <clears throat> countless swarms to the point that beekeepers were calling because they didn't have equipment for all the swarms that they had. So there goes your honey colony, right? Or I mean, your honey uh, harvest. Uh, and another problem that we saw was that the bees were not moving their honey up. They're storing the honey in the brood boxes so the queen had no place to lay eggs. So she was shutting down. So we saw that a lot this spring, um, even this summer and, and this fall, I was finding what I would call honey hoarding, where the bees were not storing the honey upstairs. They weren't drawing out the uh, foundation. They are keeping all down in that bottom box. So that, that has been a problem. And then our, our typical um, brood maladies that I want to talk about as well. Uh, lots of brood maladies. Uh, we saw it all this year. We saw chalk brood in the spring, uh, uncapping because of mites, um, a lot of um, bee diseases. Excuse me. I always uh, start getting nervous here. Um, this has happened a couple of years in a row in the spring because we have long, cool, wet spring. And the bees can't get out. There is no nectar flow. And if there is, the bees aren't out to get it. And you look in these cells and those larvae are dry. There's tiny larvae, bigger larvae. They should be floating in royal jelly. They should be floating in bee food. That's how they get their nourishment. So these bee larvae, they dry up um, and they die. And you can see the little skeletons in here. And another interesting thing is, is why didn't the nurse bees pull these out? Um, think about that. So we had problems with um, really three different problems that can cause this. Um, either you don't have enough nurse bees because you don't have the production. Um, there is no nectar flow as we talked about. Um, if you make hard splits and you don't add those nurse bees to the colony that you're splitting, this happens. So you need to feed these bees, feed them uh, one to one, try to stimulate those nurse bees to feed those larvae because how many of those larvae are gonna actually emerge as adult bees? So the colonies were going backwards because you're, you didn't have enough new bees emerging. So it looks like European fibroid, but it, but it wasn't, it was just lack of food. So when you see this type of thing, when your larvae are dry in those cells, feed them um, as soon as possible. Um, another case here that we saw this quite a bit in the spring, um, the bees were starving. So they might have had honey upstairs, maybe it was uh, left over from last year, and, but they were not, they didn't have access to it down where the brood was. So right, it's feast or famine, right? Some colonies were hoarding all the honey in the brood boxes and some had none. Um, so in this particular case, you can see it's a poor brood pattern because the brood was dying, the pupae were dying and the bees were pulling them out. You can see all through here, these are all dead pupae the bees are pulling out. Uh, they probably were eating these uh, because they needed the protein. So they didn't have any honey. Um, they didn't have enough bees coming along, new bees coming along. So the colony was losing bees in every generation. They were losing more and more bees because you didn't have enough 
newbies emerging. So you, you can just you can tell that the, the larvae or the pupae are, are dying because they, they weren't fully fed. Uh, failing queen, again, this is late May and there's hardly any bees in there. I mean, this colony was was in the in ready to crash. So again, poor brood pattern. Um, there's no honey down here, and the colony was shrinking. So we uh, recommended that they feed these bees um, as soon as possible. Put a new queen in there, uh, hopefully an Ohio certified queen, so that she can get you know, immediately start laying eggs and start to to stimulate the whole process of laying eggs and having some new young nurse bees emerge to, to feed those larvae. So that was the answer to that one. Uh, this is a case where the colony was honey bound. There was no room for the queen to lay eggs and the queen disappeared. I mean, maybe she was in there, but uh, we went through every frame. We couldn't find her. There was no eggs, no young larva, and they had some pretty nice looking queen cells down here. So. We uh, moved the uh, frames of pollen to the outside, <clears throat> put some empty frames of drawn comb, drawn comb in the center. Uh, so the queen had a place to lay eggs, put the honey right outside of that and uh, just kind of waited, checked in a couple of weeks to see if that one of those queens had mated, you know, and come back and was laying eggs and was, was healthy. They also had a pretty high mite population Uh, but since they had a brood break with no new larvae coming along, that should have helped them a little bit to uh, back on the mites. So hopefully just by rearranging and introducing a new queen, that colony was able to take off again. A uh, wingless queen, this was really interesting. A uh, gentleman ordered a, a bunch of um, a bank of uh, queen cells. So he had some queenless colonies. They had been queenless for a couple of weeks. Um, bees, a colony is more likely to accept a queen cell than a queen in a cage when they've been queenless for a while. So he ordered these queen cells, uh, they were shipped to him, and the day that he received them, they were emerging, he was putting them in the hives as they were emerging, and they were emerging with no queen, with no eggs. So we called around, um, I did some uh, little digging, found out that because those queen cells had been shipped uh, toward the end of their development, if those cells were jiggled or got too hot, somehow they were damaged in those last few days, uh, 14 through 16, when the wings are being developed, that can be enough for those wings to stop developing, to stop expanding. So we think that that's uh, what happened. Uh, however, I had an experienced beekeeper say that mites can also cause that if the mite, damp, mite population was high, it would prevent the wings from developing. So just, we just have something we have to keep an eye out for. Uh, European fibroid, we're still plagued with this. Uh, we seem to have more problems with it every year. So European fibroid, again, the larvae, they maintain their shape, they get flaccid, they kind of lose that plump white look they dry out, they maintain their shape, they turn into little skeletons. Um, sometimes the larvae will kind of flip so the heads are sticking out of the cell, but they keep their shape. Here's another one, it still has that shape, uh, but it's just kind of flattening out. And here's another one. So European fibrin is a bacteria. The nurse bees feed it to the larvae. Um, when they, the larvae ingest it, uh, when they're taking the food from the nurse bee. <clears throat> that, that bacteria gets into the, the bee's gut, uh, destroys the inside of the bee, and a bee just starts to, to rot from the inside out. Uh, but it maintains its shape. So when you see this, feed it. That's the best thing you can do is feed it with sugar syrup. Basically, you're gonna be kind of flushing, introducing more sugar, introducing more sugar syrup to flush it out of those bees. And a lot of times that enough can help uh, if you see ugly frames like this, take them out and burn them. Don't start switching frames uh, between hives or yards because you can just spread this. So feed them. If it continues, uh, requeen it. Um, I don't recommend using antibiotics for any bee disease. Um, 
now you have to have a, a veterinary prescription to get it so it's harder so if you can just do some physical things like burning these frames feeding them maybe introduce a new queen if it continues um, often that is enough to um, stop this and also of course you want to reduce the entrance uh, so that they're not robbed so american fall brood which is also a bacteria in a European farbird, those symptoms are pretty similar. Uh, the difference with American farbird is that they die in the pupa stage. So they've already been capped and they're in the pupa stage and they rot. So again, that bacteria basically is dissolving that pupa. So the, it's diagnostic if you take a stick and put it down in one of these capped pupal cells that's collapsed, you know, jiggle it around in there, stir it around and pull it up, and you get this brown sinew it looks looks like snot really sorry um, that's diagnostic it's this looks easy it's not always that easy so if you see something wrong with your bees please please call ask an experienced beekeeper ask your county inspector uh call me um let us let us help you figure this out just don't let it go let it go and to see if it goes away by itself uh, because it won't it just keeps getting worse and you'll have more and more colonies uh, be infected. So you can cut a sample of this comb out, uh, wrap it in paper and put it in a crush proof box and send it to Beltsville and they can diagnose it. Uh, Vita Bee Health has a diagnostic kit, which if you use it correctly, uh, that can help you diagnose it as well. But please call us and let us help. This is a, a close up of uh, American fowl brood. Again, you can see how the capped pupae have Kind of collapsed, they're kind of greasy looking. Uh, the bee nurse bees have tried to uh, remove these pupa, they start chewing through them and pulling them out. You can kind of see there's a little bit of a, a dead brown pupa in there uh, that has died from American fabric. So, this is this is American fabric, which is extremely uh, contagious. Um, so when I'm out looking around the, the state. I see um, co uh, colonies that have all different names from different bee suppliers. And, and it, it is kind of interesting to see that. Um, however, you have to be very careful because that is how you can introduce American fabric or other diseases into your yard. So when you're buying nukes or you're buying old equipment, uh, first of all, I never, never use old brood comb. Just never do. If you buy a nuke or, or you know, a bee colony from somebody, make sure that you're buying equipment that has been inspected because it's just not worth it. Once you have American fall brood in your yard, it's there for 70 to 100 years and you're going to be plagued with it every year. Um, so it's still here. Uh, so please keep an eye on it. Um, we've been seeing more of it this year, the last few years, uh, partly, I think because people have been stockpiling teramycin and it probably isn't working as well anymore. Um, it's harder to find because you need that prescription. And I think some people are just not bothering because it's harder to find uh, teramycin. Remember that teramycin only hides the symptoms. It does not kill the, the spore. So the best thing, unfortunately, is to burn those hives. So just, just be careful and only buy approved inspected equipment or or don't buy it at all um moving into summer so we have had uh mite problems it was so hot this summer that beekeepers couldn't get in to treat uh, uh, most of those treatments uh don't you know you don't want to use it when it's super hot so our mite population has exploded and you think about it once we have a nectar flow you have all those drones being produced. From that point on, that's when your mite population starts to go up. So it's 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 going to be here all summer. They don't just show up in the fall. Um, we had problems with the queens laying duds. They weren't mated well. They were being superseded. So we had problems with that. So you can't just assume your bees are okay. Um, check them. You know, go in there once a week. You know, once a month probably more, more like once a month. Make sure you have a laying queen in there. Um, from August on, that queen is laying winter bees. 
So you want your bees to be super strong, well fed from August on, because those are the bees that have to survive all winter long. Um, we've, again, we found colonies that were honey bound, so the queen had no place to lay eggs. So you have no new bees coming along. Remember that bees are, adult bees are only gonna live about 30 days. So if you don't have new bees coming along, you're gonna have a, a lapse in your uh, bee production. Um, we had hungry bees this fall because they had no honey. So again, those bees probably aren't gonna, you know, survive the winter because they weren't well fed, they weren't well nursed, they don't have all the all the proteins that they need to survive the winter. And then we need to keep checking for pests. So small high beetles are an indicator of stress. Um, we always see them in the fall, and I don't worry about them too much if they're on the inner cover. But when they're down in your brood frames, that's a problem. That tells me that, that you don't have enough bees to keep those beetles away. So if you have a strong colony, you have plenty of bees per frame, they can keep those beetles away from the brood. But once the beetles are down in your brood come, you're gonna have a hard time getting that colony to, to come around. So the Vera mite, sorry. Um, Keep in mind that three quarters of all the mites are in your capped brood. So all these treatments that you use that only knock the mites off the adult bees, um, you know, that helps, but it's not, not doing anything to protect your bee larva. So the bee larvae are the ones that are being <clears throat> um, affected the most by the bees, by the mites. Those mites are chewing on those bee larvae and, and damaging and weakening them. So you look at this uh, cell down here. Um, this is uh, Scott Svob's picture. Uh, that colony had way more than three mites per hundred bees in this picture. Uh, that colony probably isn't going to make it. Um, so don't just don't don't just go by the number of mites that you find on the adult bees. Th this is what's critical right here. So you just you know just just keep an eye on that. So look, look at your pupa, see if you have chewed pupa, see if you have, you know, damaged uh, larva. That's what you want to look for. So uh, Dr. Sam Ramsey uh, took these pictures. This is uh, the mouth parts of a varroa mite. And you look at that, they have chewing, grasping, you know, gnawing mouth part. Um, they're cutting through the exoskeleton of the bee and chewing on their fat bodies. And this is a cross section showing the varroa mite between two segments of a of a bee's uh, abdomen. That so they're hanging on with their mouth parts and their tarsal claws. That mite's not going anywhere. If you're just sprinkling sugars, you know, powdered sugar in your hive, thinking that the bees are going to clean each other and knock these mites off, they don't. That mite's not moving. It is not coming off that bee. So you know we have to we have to think like a mite when we're you know, managing our mite population. So bees get PMS, um, parasitic mite syndrome. It's basically, it's a virus. It's, it's uh, actually, it's more of a combination of bacteria with virus. So you think about it, the mites are opening, you know, they're causing openings in the bee larva, all kinds of bacteria and fungi live in a, in a beehive. Um, they live in those nice dark cells. So yeah, there's propolis on the outside, on the in, interior of the hive, but in those cells, those mites are walking around carrying all kinds of bacteria and, and diseases on them, or microbes on them. So they break through the exoskeleton of the bee, they're feeding on the bee, and all these bacteria invade those bees. So they turn into kind of a soup of bacteria and they lose their shape. So they turn into blobs. So when you see blobs like this, whether or not you see a mite on it, this is PMS or some type of virus. Um, so this is a symptom that you've had high enough mites in your brood to cause, you know, cause damage. If you look at this, you know, these pupae have died. They had you know, some kind of a mite problem or disease. So the bees have chewed through these and are pulling them out. 
So this is a sign when you see this, you need to treat ASAP and preferably with something that's going to kill the mites and the brood as well as the adults. Excuse me. So we have all we have all the viruses that the other states have. Uh, we're very good at sharing viruses with the other states. So uh, we have to, we have to be vigilant. So people say, well, I don't didn't think I had mites because I didn't see any deformed wings. Well, this little bee, she went through her whole development, emerged as an adult. She can't function as an adult. She's probably going to die in about five days. Um, all that damage was done when she was a pupa. So even if you're not seeing mites on the adult bees or you're not seeing deformed wings, those mites are causing the damage on the pupa. That's that's where the that's what we have to worry about is the damage on the pupa. Um, whether or not you see deformed wings, whether or not you see mites on the adult bees, it's the larva and the pupae that are being damaged the most. And then you have to wonder, does the queen have it too? Because the bees are feeding each other, they're spreading it to each other, and the, the you know that's how the virus is spread in the colony. It, it's it's easy. We make too big of a deal out of the process, but it's easy to check your mite level, and you should be doing it once a month. You look down in the cells and you see, you know, this is mite mite feces here, and this mite is, uses it as a ladder to climb out of the cell. See, there's a mite there that hasn't hardened off yet. There's two more mites down here. Each, each bee can have three to four mites emerge on it. So think how quickly that mite population can increase in a colony. <clears throat> so if you see this mite feces down in here, you're, you have a high mite population. So this graph was made by um, Dr. Randy Oliver uh, with Scientific Beekeeping, and he shows the the trend of the bee population compared to the mite population. So our honeybee population kind of peaks around July, June, July. And then after that, um, we, are, we lose our honey flow. Uh, egg production starts to slow down. Mite population, on the other hand, it actually starts to increase because you have fewer bees, you have more mites. You know, there, every, every three weeks, your number of mites actually triples in a colony. So the mite population is increasing at the very time that the bee population is starting to go down. So you end up having more mites per bee. So if you can keep your mite population on this red line uh, below the point where you have more mites and bees, below the population of the trend of the number of bees in your colony, a colony stands a chance of surviving. But when you have these high number of mites, uh, that colony, oh, it's going to struggle. And how many of those winter bees are going to be able to survive until spring? That's the question we have to ask. So we really encourage you, that, and that's not just me, it's the researchers all, all around the United States, to check your mite population every month. Um, I can't recommend products. However, this Easy Check uh, by Vita Pharma, it makes it so easy uh, to use. So you see these lines in here, top line is 300 bees. You put 300 bees in there, uh, knock the queen, uh, knock it in there. Uh, you fill this line up to the bottom of this white shaker thing with uh, alcohol. I use a little bit of, I add uh, windshield fluid just to spread the alcohol out a little bit more and you shake it vigorously. And then you can hold this up and look down here You can count the number of mites it dropped. Um, you can pour it out on a coffee filter uh, and know exactly how many mites you have per hundred. That's, that's the best indicator, the most efficient, effective way of testing your mite population. So we did this a couple of years ago. Jamie and I were out looking. Uh, these are really bad colonies. They're full of small high beetles. 45 mites per 300 bees. Uh, you don't have to do the division down to 100 bees. It's way too many, too many mites, um, and that colony probably didn't make it. And it's easy now. It's easy to know how, what to use, how to treat your bees for mites. Um, Honeybee Health Coalition has has made this so incredibly efficient. You can go on here. You can download this for free. I tell you per season what the best products are. 
They have videos to show you how to use all this stuff. If you don't want to use chemical, they have non-chemical ways of helping to control mites. But do something. That's the key. Do something that is labeled, that is legal <laughs> to, to help control your mite population. So you have options. Some people, they don't want to, they think they might, their bees are wild animals, um, which they are, and they don't want to control. So those bees usually die every year. <clears throat> Some people don't want to use chemicals, and that usually is not enough to keep the mite population low. Ideally, you want to use IPM, which is the use of cultural ways, having good bees, uh, physical ways, your screen bond board, brood break, what have you, and, and a chemical to keep your mite population below, at or below, three mites per hundred bees. These pictures are, are Dwight Wells. He has these bees that actually can chew the legs off the mite, which is really interesting. And, and it's a good, good part of your IPM program to have hygienic bees. Um, to continue with that, you, if your bees continue uh, survive the winter, make splits of those. So you can use your own stock, your own genetic line, and try to keep, avoid depending on packages because you're introducing all those new viruses and new genetic lines into your bees. So, you know, make splits of your own colonies that survive and breed from the strongest, most, you know, vigorous bees. That's the best thing you can do. But even hygienic bees, if they have height, might pressure, you need to treat because all these BQB probably died because they had mites. So moving on to fall, um, your colonies right now, they should weigh at least 80 pounds. So go to the back of your colony, use your hands, then lift up the back of your colony. So the front end, of course, is still, still on the ground. Lift up. If you can't budge that colony, if it's nailed to the ground, that colony is probably fine. If you can lift it easily with two hands or one hand, that colony is, is struggling. Uh, they need to be fed ASAP, if not beforehand. So they should weigh at least 80 pounds. You wanna condense these colonies. Take all those frames of foundation, get them out. Bees are not gonna fill out foundation at this time of year. So get rid of the frames of foundation. You only want frames that have bees, um, brood or honey on them, or, or a little bit of pollen maybe. But you want those frames to be full of bees. So compact, combine, whatever you need to do, keep those colonies strong for the winter because they can't wander around trying to find honey in the winter time. They need to be compact. So feed them if they need to be fed, uh, keep those colonies contact, compact. Uh, bees can defend themselves away from, um, from small hive beetles if you have lots of bees per frame. Um, so that's the key and try to find places next spring um, that have lots of forage. Those bees are gonna do much better. <laughs> um, research has shown that if your bees have sufficient forage, year round forage, um, they can combat the mites and the viruses and other stresses so much better. So find, try to find places that have year round forage. This picture, this is Dwight's, it was taken uh, last month. So you want your colonies to look like this. They're covered with bees and brood, um, compact like that, so they can survive the winter. That's that's the key. So this picture, um, this is taken up in Trumbull County. Um, it was a um, buckwheat that was interplanted with uh, sunflowers. So these bees are doing great. They had all kinds of forage there. Um, this is this is in October. So those bees are doing great. So we're kind of changing gears here. <coughs> Sorry, um, talk about dead bees. We get calls about this every year. If you suspect that your bees have been damaged or killed by pesticide, please call the pesticide division as soon as possible. You should at least walk by your hives, you know, every couple of weeks to see, you know, make sure those bees are okay. Um, they can die from other things. They can die from mites. They can die from starvation. But if you suspect that it's pesticides, 
call the pesticide division or email them as soon as possible. Uh, collect some bees for yourself in case you want to send them somewhere, get information on what the application may have been, who the applicator is, and um, but do this as fast as possible. Once we've had rain and lots of sun, that chemical, if it is in the bees, it breaks down pretty quickly. So time is of the essence with this. And uh, sign up for Bee Check. It's free. Um, you just go in there. You can actually put a pin right where your apiary is. So, so the applicator can get in there and see where your hive is, notify you if they're going to use something toxic or hopefully toxic to bees, or hopefully they'll say, hey, they've got bees there. Why don't I try something that is safer for bees? So a little bit of information for the applicators is a big help. So to kind of round up here, um, for to keep your bees as healthy as possible, try to keep your mite and your pest level low all season long. Put your bees where they have natural forage. Um, feed them if they need to be fed. And uh, check your bees at least once a month. Make sure you got a laying queen in there. And work with us. Uh, we're here to help you have healthy bees. We want, that's a bottom line. We want healthy bees, good pollination. So read the books, read the ABJ and the bee culture this winter. Uh, talk to experienced beekeepers. Um, try to learn as much as you can this winter when we're off. Um, and remember that the top pest for top reason that bees die still in the United States is varomite. So the other pests, small high beetles, they're usually showing up because the bees are weak. So watch out, keep your mite level low all season long. And um, this is advice is from Howard Baldwin um, for third year beekeepers, well, fourth year beekeepers. Um, and, and the bottom line is don't give up. You've invested three years, four years of learning. You did something wrong, something went wrong and you learn what to do. You've invested all the time and the money on all this equipment. Don't give up. Um, give it another year. Buy some nukes. <coughs> excuse me. And uh, give it. Give, put those years of experience back to work. And call us. You know, ask experienced beekeepers who, you know, they're making uh, splits of their own colonies. Um, ask people who've been keeping bees 20, 30 years. Um, who are successful. Those are the ones you want to ask. Ask us, ask the county inspectors. Um, help, you know, help, let us help you. That's, and I, I am finishing up. Um, mean bees, we get calls about this every year. Uh, we had some swarms this year that were very mean. And one bit of advice is please, um, wear a veil when you go in your yard. Take a smoker with you. Give your colonies a couple puffs of smoke and wear a veil. Even if you take it off because the bees are fine, but wear your veil when you go in the yard and open your hives. Uh, you're all important. You're important to me. And I don't want you getting hurt. So please, uh, let's use a little bit of um, vigilance here, a little bit of common sense when we're working bees. Um, so mean bees, whether or not they have Africanized genes, they act mean. And that's that's what we're talking about. Somebody plops a bunch of bees near your apiary. Um, we don't know what those genetics are. We don't know what pests and diseases they have. And ideally, they need to be far away from our local beekeepers. So my first advice is to know the property owners around you. Let them know that if someone brings new bees in, you don't know what pest diseases they have, what genetics they have. Um, it's it, They're competing with your own local bees. So, you know, let them understand, you know, the dynamics of these bees that are being brought in. Second of all, in Ohio, a pollinator yard, pollinator colonies are only there to pollinate a specific crop. They can't just be plopped down for the season and taken out in the fall. That is not a pollinator yard. Those yards need to be registered by law. So if it's for pollinating, they need to be taken out within a week after that crop is done blooming. Otherwise they need to be registered. 
So keep that in mind as well. Um, make sure that your hives are registered um, so that we can you know, protect your colonies at least. Um, provide enough food for your bees. Make sure they have plenty of forage. Make sure they have constant water all year long, all season long, constant source of clean water and buy local stock. That way you know that those bees have survived our winters. They don't have some of those genes that we need to avoid. Um, this particular case here, um, the bees were plopped down uh, near her and they were cleaning out her bird bath every day. She could not keep water in it for the birds. Um, the bees had no water. There's too many colonies for that area. They are heavily co uh, competing for food and water. Um, it was a very bad situation. And the problem is that the Tucson lab doesn't test for Africanized genes anymore. Um, and even if they do, if we do the DNA testing, it only tests the queen line, it doesn't test the drones. So if the queen made with a drone that had Africanized genes, there's no way to test it. And, and the problem is that the, they have been intermating or mating for so many years that they both have genes of, the, of each other. So it's very difficult to actually test and differentiate it anyhow. But the point is, if you have local bees, local queen, local stock, we're not gonna have these problems. So let's help us protect each other. Let's help us protect ourselves in our, in our, in our honeybees. So um, finishing up here, we're still getting calls about the Asian giant hornet. And I do encourage you, if you see something you don't recognize, you know, send it to me. Uh, you can go to this website here uh, at Ohio Department of Agriculture, send us a picture and help us identify it because this is gonna be a problem from now on that we need to watch for it. So please let us know if you see something strange. And with that, I wanna finish up. I wanna thank you, um, Peggy and Jamie and the OSBA board for making this happen. This has been a hard year, very challenging year. and. Uh, <laughs> um, I would thank you for helping us at least have a conference. And I want to recognize Barry um, for being a mentor to probably all of us, uh, and you'll be deeply missed. Um, with that, um, I've got some B links uh, for you. And I want to ask you to please, when you watch those YouTubes, remember um, that anybody can post anything online. So they may be in another state, another part of the country, they may have no idea what they're talking about. They don't always tell you if their bees survived. So please be careful when you're watching those YouTubes. There's a lot of bad information and illegal stuff being going on. Um, and I encourage you to take the Be Informed uh, survey this uh, spring. Uh, there's a lot of good information on there for us and they depend on us beekeepers to take it. It tells us you know, what works and what doesn't work. So please do uh, plan to take that. Uh, this is my phone number and my email. Um, please let me know if you have questions or problems. Um, I'm here to help. So with that, I want to thank you. And um, this back to Jamie. All right, we're going to unmute Nina, which is now Barb. All right, am I on? Yes, ma'am. Hello. I have some questions for you coming right up. Okay, Barb, here's uh, the first question. I'd like to know your thoughts about my first year experience. I got a package end of April, and in the third week of having them, they swarmed. That is the beginning of my first year. Was not and abscond, and it certainly taught me a lot of, about beekeeping. But how likely is it for a package to swarm in the first three weeks in a brand new hive? I'm betting you had another queen in there. Um, I got other people here who can voice their opinions too. But sometimes, you know, they're shaking those bees into that package. It'd be very easy for them to shake a, a virgin queen in there. So, you know, she flies out, mate comes back, and then they, they swarm. So that's probably what happened, and it does happen. Um, it's bad when it happens to a first-year beekeeper. 
<laughs> but it does happen. So did they did they make it? Oh, this was asked over the chat. So Barb, we don't know if they made it or what happened after it. Okay, sorry. Second question, Barb. Has there been any reports of the Moku virus in Ohio? If that's how you pronounce that. Yeah, the, so the Moku virus, I, I, I read about that. I, there have been no, um, no reports of it. So I didn't do the honeybee health survey this year. Uh, so they could have tested for that, I suspect. But I don't think it's been found yet in the United States. Uh, but they are certainly looking for it. But the symptoms look a lot like the symptoms that we have where the larva just turn into goo. Like we need another virus. All right, the next question. What is I, the reason for a queen bee absconding from a stressed hive? Isn't it suicidal? Yeah, it's probably might. I mean, I don't, I don't really understand if it's the queen that left or, or you know, a, a, a colony, you know, a bunch of them. But they will leave when, when the mites are high. They'll leave if small high beetles are high. Yeah, if they're being robbed, they'll leave too. But yeah, they'll abscond uh, with either small high beetles or high mites. The next question, Barb, do we often mistake waste from a heavy winter mite infestation for crystallized sugar? I wonder how many times I've done this myself. So I think crystallized sugar, easy for me to say, because I've been seeing it for a while, but crystallized sugar is larger, more granular, and I'm using my hands. <laughs> uh, but one is gonna be in the frames with sugar, I mean, the frames with the honey in the outer frames, not in your brood frames. Um, the, the frass from the mites is much more fine, like almost like a like fish scale, so it's finer. Not to um, confuse that with American fall brood, but it's much finer. I mean, you're looking at a tiny little mite, and imagine what poop you know, comes out of that mite. So it's smaller and finer. And it would be in the brood frames, not in the honey frames. So I think I think you'd be able to tell the difference. You can always taste it, right? <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Okay, another question, Barb. What if you find a bunch of dead small high beetles on your screen bottom board? Is this from the bees killing them off? I suspect that some of the bees had left and um, left the high beetles behind. They either left or they died. Um, so honeybees can, they do try to go after small high beetles, but they're not very successful at it because they, the beetles kind of hunker down. So if you're seeing a bunch of dead small high beetles, that's because the bees probably died or they, they absconded and left the beetles behind. Another question, Barb. I am a first year beekeeper and my nuke also swarmed after four weeks. Why didn't the bees move up into the supers? So I'm reading into that and congratulations for being a first year beekeeper. My reading into that, that they stored all the honey down in the bottom boxes. So the queen had no place to lay eggs. So we've seen this all over Ohio. It's not because it was a nuke. Um, especially with a nuke, if it's a real nuke, you know, by definition, those nukes are usually ready to take off. And so you need to, you know, keep an eye on it and move the frames of honey up and make sure that you have empty drawn comb for the queen to lay eggs in. So we had all of us had to do that this year, not just nuke, nuke people, people with nukes. Okay, I think this is our last question, Barb. Why do some hives swarm in the fall? They're usually absconding and not um, swarming. So bees, and I, I've asked uh, Dr. Dennis Van Engelsdorp this question specifically. Um, and they, they leave for three reasons. They will abscond, so the whole colony leaves if they're irritated. I mean, this can be from mites, can be from either trachea mites or aurora mites, can be from small high beetles. 
it's some kind of stress in the colony. If the colony is slowly just disappearing a few at a time, it's because those bees are sick and they're leaving the colony to, to die. So if they if they're if it's a true swarm, so they make a new queen and some bees leave and some queens stay, um, they are probably trying to requeen because it was a bad queen. But if the whole colony leaves, that's absconding. And it's because they were stressed. 